Good day, everyone. My name is Jack Hanna. Uh, I'm the former uh, interim chair of the Pennsylvania Democratic Party and then state treasurer for five years. And I'm host today uh, for this webinar that we're very pleased and happy for you to have us um, present to you. Um, welcome everyone on this Veterans Day of 2020. Uh, and welcome to the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition's webinar on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation and President Roosevelt's preparations for World War II's economic mobilization. Some of you may have already viewed our previous webinars on the history of the bank and how it would work and the infrastructure that it would uniquely finance at this moment of time when long-term unemployment threatens our economic recovery from the raging pandemic, while the nation's infrastructure needs continue to be ignored as they have been for the last 60 years. <clears throat> Excuse me. A somewhat similar situation existed about 80 years ago in the 1930s when our country was recovering from the Great Depression and the gathering clouds of World War II were beginning to threaten our country's national security. How did FDR address the economic crisis of the Great Depression and also prepare for the great conflict that World War II became? Our knowledgeable and esteemed guests today shall present to you the intriguing tale of how our country arose to the huge national challenge of bringing our country out of a major depression and at the same time prepared our nation for a wartime economy. Our first guest uh, I'm very pleased and honored to present to you is Stephen Fenberg, who is a nationally renowned author of Unprecedented Power, Jesse Jones, Capitalism and the Common Good, and also the producer um, of an Emmy Award winning documentary, Brother, Can You Spare a Billion? Stephen, the floor is yours to uh, launch our webinar this morning and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Jack, so much. I'm honored to be here on Veterans Day to talk about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which saved capitalism during the Great Depression and saved democracy during World War II. President Herbert Hoover established the RFC in 1932 with great reluctance. Uh, it's important to realize the federal budget in 1932, get this, was $4 billion. It was tiny. That's about $80 billion in today's money. So Hoover was very reluctant to use the government to address the calamity of the Great Depression and instead relied upon declarations that the uh, depression was disappearing, the economy was sound, and we should all volunteer to help our neighbors. Well, that's all great, but it didn't work. So by 1932, he was intelligent and flexible enough to understand that he had to use government to address the problem. And he started the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to make loans to banks, insurance companies, and railroads, thinking that that would restore confidence and get the economy to turn again. He appointed a bipartisan board, and that included Jesse Jones, who was Houston's preeminent developer and a very successful former chairman of the uh, Finance Committee of the Democratic National Committee. Uh, as soon as Roosevelt was inaugurated, he did not abolish the RFC because it had been established by another president from another party. He understood its merits and he supercharged it and he made Jesse Jones its chairman. Some pundits today say that the New Deal really started with Herbert Hoover and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Nonetheless, Congress passed legislation within days of Roosevelt's inauguration that supercharged the RFC and allowed it to get into the economy and, and save it. We have to remember, 
all the banks were closed when FDR was inaugurated. The entire economic system had collapsed. Gross national product had been cut in half. Stocks had lost 75% of their value. Unemployment was 25%. And suicide rates had tripled. But here's what the RFC did once it had the power. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation, our vital infrastructure bank during this critical time, saved hundreds of thousands of homes, farms, banks, and businesses. It brought electricity to rural America when only 20% of the people then had power. And then it helped them buy appliances on credit so they could plug into the modern age. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation saved the railroads, much like we need to save the airlines today. It helped them refinance their debt. It financed the development of high-speed trains. Even more, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, as we grapple with our infrastructure today, it built roads, highways, bridges, tunnels, aqueducts. And here's the amazing part of all of this. During the Great Depression, our nation's most devastating economic catastrophe. The reconstruction finance did all of these monumental things and it made money for the American taxpayer while doing so. And the programs worked. By 1936, industrial output had doubled from the time Roosevelt took office. Detroit was churning out more cars in 1936 than it did in 1929 and unemployment had decreased by 8%. And this is all while war is stirring in Europe. And here we are on Veterans Day, also known as Armistice Day, which commemorates the end of World War I. Jesse Jones gave a speech on November 11th, 1938, right after Kristallnacht, when Nazi-backed mobs destroyed homes, businesses and synagogues belonging to Jews in Austria, Italy, and Germany. And I would like to take this moment to read his quote from a speech that he made November 11th, 1938. And the quote is as relevant now as it was when he said it. This is what he said about the end of World War I in 1938. Fundamentally, our entry into the World War occurred because the people of the United States felt forces were loose in the world which, if they succeeded, would outrage every moral law. If force was to take the place of right, if truth and honor were dead, if the pledged word meant nothing, if the common human rights of endless races were to be freely violated, then the world would cease to be civilized. He continued, in a belligerent world, it is no small task to keep the peace. It is the greatest task in the world today. It is an American task calling for American leadership. It is to that task we must dedicate ourselves on Armistice Day. And during that time, when he was reading those words, war was spreading through Europe and the United States was completely unprepared. Our military ranked 17th in the world. Germany's military budget was 20 times the size of ours. They had 9,000 airplanes. The Japanese had 7,500 airplanes. And we had about 2,000 airplanes that were left from World War I. We were unprepared. And Roosevelt's hands were tied because of neutrality acts that uh, forbid war, uh, selling arms to warring nations, and also the public was vehemently opposed to intervening in the European war unless the United States was directly attacked. But Roosevelt had another option. He had an infrastructure bank. He had Jesse Jones and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. And the RFC was so popular, it was almost universally embraced by Republicans and Democrats, conservatives and liberals. And every time Jesse Jones went to Congress for an appropriation, he was never once turned down. So Roosevelt sent Jones to Congress to get the appropriations needed to start militarizing industry. 
And here is what happened. On June, I can't remember the exact date, I think it was 25th, 1940, Jones went to Congress and he reported they gave him, quote, the dictionary. And here's what the RFC was able to do then. The first thing it did was it established subsidiary corporations to uh, take care of whatever needs were apparent and, and needed to be addressed. And the effort was unified and comprehensive. So the first corporation was the Metal Reserves Corporation. And Jones and the RFC began accumulating rubber and tin from around the world, strategic commodities that were in short supply and were essential to field the armed services. Then it established Defense Plant Corporation, probably the most significant of all the subsidiaries. Defense Plant Corporation made over 4,000 defense loans and it built more than 2,300 enormous plants to manufacture the tanks, trucks, airplanes, and ships that were required to fight and win World War II. The RFC owned these plants and leased them to corporations to operate. It also uh, established Defense Supplies Corporation through that, it assembled and accumulated wool and cotton for soldiers' uniforms. It cornered the market on silk for parachutes. It grew hemp in forests and uh, cornered the market of sisal to make rope. It did everything it needed to do to comprehensively address mobilization and militarizing in time to fight and win World War II. And I have another quote I'd like to read since this is Veterans Day. And this is what Jesse Jones wrote about Defense Supplies Corporation. And this is for all the veterans out there. This is what he wrote. Defense Supplies largest loan was one with which I think the whole American people may be very well pleased. We were glad to arrange it, and I like to think it helped bring some joy and comfort to every soldier who served in the army and over, at home and overseas. It was a series of advances totaling $71,153,521 to the Army Post Exchange Service to finance the establishment and operation of post exchange stores. And it was fully repaid before the end of the war. Wherever our troops were sent, they usually found convenient to their stations a PX in which they could buy some of the everyday articles and amenities which had been familiar to them as civilians at peace with all the world. In many a far corner of the globe, a PX blossomed with American ice cream, American soft drinks and beer, watches, cigarettes and candies, as well as souvenirs the GI could buy to send back home. That was just one thing the Reconstruction Finance Corporation did during World War II. And I had to read that in honor of our veterans and our soldiers. The RFC's efforts were comprehensive and unified. It built the first tin smelter in the United States in collaboration with the Dutch. And maybe even more amazing is its development of synthetic rubber from the lab to mass production, just as the Japanese took our supply of natural rubber when they took the Pearl Harbor in 1941. Without the RFC's orchestration of that effort, the Allied forces most likely would have been stuck in place and unable to fight. The RFC, our nation's infrastructure bank, during two of our most challenging events of the 20th century was indispensable. Just like a new infrastructure bank is indispensable today to rebuild our crumbling bridges that are so dangerous, to restore water systems where the water is unfit to drink, to build storm surge barriers along the Gulf Coast so the Port of Houston won't erupt in some environmental catastrophe the next time a hurricane hits directly at the port. It can bring broadband and internet access to rural areas, just like the RFC brought electricity to rural areas and then help people plug into the modern age back then. 
So I would like to conclude my talk with thanking the veterans who gave their lives for our freedom and for the soldiers now who risk and devote theirs to keep us free. Thank you very much. And Jack, I will turn the talk back to you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that very enlightening uh, presentation with regard to the bank. Um, I would like to prompt everyone that is watching uh, the webinar that uh, we have a Q&A uh, mechanism with regard uh, to any questions that you may have of our panelists that uh, we will um, review with them uh, after their presentations. Uh, so please keep that in mind. Uh, our next presenter um, is Alfeka Mutardi, who is a macro economist and the policy director for the Coalition for National Infrastructure uh, Banks uh, uh, organization. We are very happy to have you here, Alfeka, and I believe you're going to be talking to us about how the bank actually functions and operates and uh, uh, the economic basis and reasons behind that. Uh, your turn, Alfeka, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Jack, and um, welcome to everyone who's attending our webinar today and very happy uh, Veterans Day to all of you. So what I'm going to talk to you today about is, is the present day situation and how we can use a national infrastructure bank today to mobilize and refurbish our economy and put people back to work who have become unemployed uh, during the COVID uh, shutdown. We don't know how the shutdown is going to work itself out. We're now going into a second um, pandemic period, which could be very severe this winter. We could have uh, more shutdowns and more economic uh, uh, loss of jobs on account of it. So there could be sort of a double dip recession. And uh, while we have maybe some, uh, maybe 15 million people out of work now, uh, it could be really much more severe uh, than that. So uh, we do have a proposal for a, a um, a, a, an institution similar to the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to build infrastructure in America today. And it is embodied in a piece of legislation called HR 6422, the National Infrastructure uh, Bank Act of 2020. It was introduced into uh, to the House of Representatives by Representative Danny Davis from Illinois. And uh, we have a uh, co-sponsors on the bill, uh, Seth Moulton from Massachusetts, Debbie Dingle from Michigan, and um, Bobby Rush, also from Illinois. Uh, and we're looking for many more co-sponsors, and we are uh, really attempting to bring this piece of legislation up to the attention of the incoming Biden administration uh, as a possible solution to uh, today's economic problems. So I'm going to speak to you uh, uh, as with my hat on as a macroeconomist and tell you a little bit about our federal budget, uh, which has been uh, put into huge disarray right now. Um, this, this fiscal year alone, for example, we've run up a, a new deficit of at least $4 trillion. Uh, and we should probably be having another large deficit next year uh, if, if we have a second double dip, dip recession. So um, the federal budget is in disarray, but even for a long period of time, since the last re since the Reconstruction Finance Corporation closed its doors in 1957, we have re had real difficulty in financing infrastructure through the federal budget. Um, this, the amount of money that we're spending th there, and also that state and local governments are spending, has fallen way off. We measured it by dividing it by uh, gross domestic product or GDP. Um, back in the 60s, we were spending 4% of GDP on infrastructure, and today it's something like 2.3% and falling very quickly uh, because state finances are in disarray and they've had to cut back on infrastructure projects and also because the federal government uh, has this large deficit and uh, debt overhang that I've been speaking to you about. So this bank, what it would do would take the responsibility for financing infrastructure off of the uh, federal books uh, uh, and put it into this, in, this uh, um, uh, mixed ownership bank that would be part public and part private. Uh, and they would, uh, this bank would actually 
uh, do all of the lending just like a commercial bank, but only for infrastructure projects. So we approached this iteration around by asking ourselves the question, how much do we need to fix today's infrastructure? And we went to the American Society of Civil Engineers who say that we need about $4.6 trillion uh, over 10 year period just to bring infrastructure up to a state of good repair. On this table that you're looking at, this is the leftmost column, uh, $4.6 trillion. And that's for uh, infrastructure that includes roads, bridges, transit, uh, water, uh, drinking water and wastewater infrastructure, schools, the electricity grid, uh, levees and waterways and ports, public uh, recreation, airports and passenger rail. Uh, that all of that would total, our total needs over a 10 year period is $4.6 trillion. And then the engineers further say in the next column over that maybe $2.5 trillion of that is funded. And what does that mean is funded? It means that that's the normal reauthorization of uh, the federal government to uh, invest in infrastructure. Things like uh, the five-year reauthorization bill for transportation and water that's contained in uh, a bill, HR2, uh, which has been passed by uh, the House of Representatives, but not entertained at all by the Senate. And so that uh, normal infrastructure spending by the federal government has, has uh, hit a roadblock because of the budget. Uh, and then it's also financed by state and local governments uh, through a pay-as-you-go system using gas taxes and stuff like that to fix roads and other things. Uh, and that's also fallen by the wayside because uh, state and local finances are in severe disarray on account of the recession. And then they might also raise uh, money by municipal bonds, which have all also fallen back. Um, so all of these sources of the normal estimated funding have fallen backwards. Um, but uh, the engineers say that uh, th there is another 2.1 trillion, that's the rightmost column on your screen, that, uh, that um, is uh, not being funded. Uh, and in addition to that, the engineers have come up with new recent estimates that increase this funding gap estimate from, uh, from 2 trillion to 3 trillion mostly on account of a new estimate for the needs for water infrastructure. Uh, water infrastructure, uh, I think that what the engineers are now saying is that any pipe that is past its lifetime uh, um, will need to be replaced. And uh, that'll, that over a 10 year period, that might be 1.1 trillion just by itself. So uh, for all those reasons, uh, we're going to actually increase the size of our bank uh, and our proposal uh, in the next legislative round to ask for uh, upwards of uh, $5 trillion uh, to finance all of the financing gap in infrastructure. And then in addition to what the engineers uh, identify, there are some other mega projects uh, that we want the bank to be able to finance. We want to widen the scope of what, the, what this bank will finance to include affordable housing, maybe as much as 7 million housing units nationwide, uh, to have a high-speed rail system, a big inauguration of many of the uh, pathways for a high-speed rail system that would move along economic corridors and, that, and then promote economic growth along those corridors. Uh, such corridors, for example, are um, Birmingham, Alabama, up to uh, Raleigh, North Carolina, or Washington, D.C., up to Boston, uh, Massachusetts, um, or um, al anywhere along the Pacific Coast Highway uh, um, uh, through California, Oregon, and Washington. All of these are economic uh, areas that if you put in high-speed rail, economic growth really gets accelerated in a big way. And the reason we know that is because we have the example of what China has done in high-speed rail, where they have uh, over a 10-year period instituted 27,000 miles of high-speed rail. That's an example of mobilization. Um, that this bank will be able to do and um, really supercharge economic growth. We think that spending four or five trillion dollars on infrastructure will really supercharge our economy. Uh, it'll put 25 million folks to work directly in construction and manufacturing jobs uh, to uh, fabricate the materials for all of these infrastructure projects. And in addition, uh, we'll have secondary uh, effects on the economy as, as folks respend all that money and really promote economic growth in a huge way. And we wanna train all these new workers uh, that'll be 
come from either among the currently unemployed or from other industries, low paying industries into these permanent construction jobs uh, that will um, last over many, many years and provide them training, uh, paying Davis-Bacon wages, um, and uh, uh, really lift up economic uh, areas that are underdeveloped, uh, such as inner city uh, areas that are in poverty or rural areas. There's a big economic program for the rural areas to um, enhance the programs of the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. And, 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 and the point is, is that the, the infrastructure investment will hire folks and fix infrastructure in every single district of the United States, because that's where we have identified the uh, infrastructure needs. So that's our plan for this iteration around and uh, how uh, it will be mobilized will be by creating this institution that will lend for this directed infrastructure investment. Thanks very much. Thank you, Alfaka. And uh, let me just state that uh, we have some excellent questions pending uh, that we will be asking uh, our panelists after their presentation. But before doing so, uh, we want to next move to our last presenter, Robert Lynn, uh, a retired organizer uh, from Toledo, Ohio, and a labor coordinator for the Coalition for a National Infrastructure Bank. Um, Bob, welcome and glad to have you um, uh, here today uh, to hear your thoughts and comments. Uh, the floor is yours. Well, good day and thank you for uh, attending this webinar. And I'd like to uh, wish all the veterans out there happy Veterans Day. Uh, this is a day uh, where America really appreciates and hopefully shows the appreciation uh, we have for all of your uh, struggle, sacrifices, etc. Thank you so much. Uh, what I want to dwell on is just a little bit more uh, specifically about what Stephen talked about when it comes to the mobilization that happened uh, directly with World War II. And just before World War II, if we stop and imagine, think about what aviation was like before that. I know he talked about how many planes that uh, Germany had and how many planes Japan had, but realistically, uh, aviation was actually in its infancy in a lot of ways. Even, even World War I, where we had uh, uh, airplanes, it wasn't a huge amount of, uh, uh, it, it had a great effect going from blimps to airplanes, but we still didn't have the uh, capacity to be able to do that. And at the time, we needed to figure out how to be able to uh, make uh, aviation uh, a real part of uh, uh, the war effort because uh, as is very evident today, those who control the air control the uh, power at the end of the day to be able to make things happen. And so uh, it required the greatest expansion of anything that we had going. Uh, most air aircraft companies at the time were relatively small enterprises uh, before the war and did not have the funds to expand. So how was that going to be done? Well, ultimately the, DP, uh, the DPC, which is the defense plant, Corporation actually is the one that invested and loaned and leased um, the plants to these uh, corporations to be able to make it, such as the Curtis Aircraft Corporation and <clears throat> United Aircraft to be able to make that happen. Um, the planes, uh, you had plane uh, plants built uh, throughout the United States. Uh, the, the largest one was actually in Michigan at Willow Run where it was a two mile factory. Uh, and uh, the amount of investment in that was $86 million <clears throat> to be able to uh, get that plant going. It was actually created in less than a year. From the time they signed it to be able to be in full production was less than a year. Construction crews were working 24 hours a day building new factories so that <clears throat> they could actually be able to address the needs that were uh, that the country needed to be able to make these things happen. And this wasn't just in aviation, this was across the board. But you had, uh, uh, you had aircraft uh, engine plants that were built. Uh, you had the Chicago Dodge aircraft facility, which covered 270 acres uh, that was created. Uh, it, one end came in basically with a, a pig of aluminum magnesium that at the end of the day, 
by the time it got to the end of, of the line was, uh, was a functioning uh, <clears throat> engine to be able to make uh, the aircraft uh, that were necessary uh, to be able to uh, uh, survive and to be able to actually uh, win the war. Uh, the, <clears throat> the RFC had many subsidiaries as, as uh, Stephen talked about. And the subsidiaries, uh, which was the Defense Plant Corporation, uh, was one of them, but it, it had another uh, factor. Uh, the DPC financed expansions of plant and equipment for many small firms, not just the big large ones. The 25 leading companies that operated DPC facilities uh, were uh, aluminum, uh, the Aluminum Company of America, Alcoa, General Motors, United States Steel, Republic Steel, Chrysler, Ford. These are very common names that we all know. But at the time, to be able to actually address and be able to uh, mobilize the effort in the United States, it took many, many corporations to be able to, to make that happen. The plants that, that uh, Stephen referred to, the 2300 projects were spread throughout the United States, but they were most heavily in our Midwest Rust Belt states at the time to be able to do uh, the work that was necessary. Michigan had 213 plants uh, for a total of $664 million investment. Ohio had 250 plants uh, for an investment of $702,222 million. It, it's staggering when you start to think about it. Goodyear, uh, and the advent or invention of uh, rubber, synthetic rubber, to be able to uh, <clears throat> go forward and be able to uh, create um, the tires, not just the tires, but all the rubber products that were necessary when it came to be able to uh, construct these large uh, uh, battleships, etc. It was uh, amazing uh, as I continued to read up on uh, the, the uh, advances uh, that have been made uh, due to the investment by the uh, RFC. The RFC, by investing in this through all these other corporations, was actually the driving force to be able to move us forward. We had an enemy. We had a goal. And what uh, set out with FDR at the beginning was the depression, was to get the American people back to work, to be able to make uh, it possible for people to actually be able to uh, survive and pick up, uh, pick up their lives and be able to, to create all that. FDR with his chats not only told the people and gave them hope, but through his actions, he was actually able to uh, go and help people by uh, giving them uh, job opportunities, etc. And at the same time, we accomplished so much, whether at the very beginning it was with the Tennessee Valley Authority, where we changed the Tennessee River, and we're able to be able to generate electricity throughout that region to be able to help the development that was so important uh, down in that area of the, of the United States. But you had the Hoover Dam, you had dams up in the, in the Northwest uh, states. It, 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 it was just um, things that needed to be addressed. They had a plan, they moved forward and, and went with it. One of the things that uh, I think is really important as we start to think about how this new National Infrastructure Bank could work is what are some of the real struggles that need to be addressed? With climate change uh, along our coast, we're talking about rising sea, sea levels. With the increase in hurricanes that we recently experienced this past year, is that new, the new normal? Is there going to be more? How do we make sure that uh, we aren't always reacting uh, to be able to go and fix uh, the infrastructure after it gets uh, devastated by one of these natural uh, occurrences? Um, it's, a, it's the opportunity to start thinking about seawalls. It's the opportunity to start thinking about flood mitigation. How do we go and, and make sure that electricity, whether it's up in the Northeast where severe um, snowstorms happen or down in the Southwest uh, or South where hurricanes and these devastating storms come. Maybe we need to go as we reevaluate it and be able to put these lines under, underground so that they're not being continually blown over. Uh, the imagination 
of where things are going to be and how they're going to happen is something that I can't even fathom. I mean, stop and think about it. Aviation was done at the very beginning of, of the 1900s. That's when it was. By 1960, we were on the moon. 60 years. We can, in so many ways, be able to make such great advances. I can remember when I got my first computer years ago. It wasn't that long ago. And now computers uh, allow us to be able to do uh, things like this, to be able to get uh, on webinars and, and be able to Zoom and, and talk to people directly uh, where we, we weren't able to do that without a huge production. I mean, this uh, iPad that I'm currently using probably has more power, and more uh, memory capacity than the computers I had that were huge that were sitting on my desk to be able to start to do some of the early work. Uh, the thing that can happen is uh, unbelievable. But the one thing that is lacking is the investment in the infrastructure in this country to be able to make it possible. The National Infrastructure Bank has that potential because it's not tied to a specific party that says this party is the only one who believes in infrastructure. All Americans believe in the infrastructure needs uh, wherever they are. Who am I to tell uh, someone in South Carolina, this is what you need? They can decide what they need. And what the, the National Infrastructure Bank is designed to do is to be able to put the financing in place to be able to make that possible so that loans can get made there. It's an opportunity for government to be able to come in and, and be able to uh, take on the risks to be able to, to move things forward. Uh, right now, uh, as we continue to go where uh, it's all about profit driven and you have to make a profit no matter what, and it's always about maximum profit, the, the higher the risk there is, the, the greater uh, interest rates they want to charge. Well, some of the things that we really need to address, the housing issues, uh, the water issues, all that kind of stuff uh, is not it's not popular. Uh, it, it's popular to people, but it's not a glamorous thing that makes a lot of money and makes people rich. But it's the necessary things that we need to do in this country to be able to move it forward. So uh, I hope as as we look at this and, and we realize that the dream of what America is and what everyone hopes to have at the end of the day, those hopes and dreams can be filled if we can invest in ourselves, invest in our communities, invest in our neighbors. We need to get back to a situation where if a plant needs to be built in order to be able to employ people in this country, that's what they did uh, back with the Refinance Corporation, to be able to invest so that people had jobs in their community, so that we could get back to your Buy American and be able to support that kind of stuff. How, do, how we do that is imperative, and the best way the best way we can do that is that really get out there and talk about a national infrastructure bank that goes and puts the financing in place. Because as my friend Stephen has said before, this was not, <clears throat> this was a loan program. This was not a debt program. We did not go out and create tons of debt. We went out there and we loaned in and invested in people. And that investment in the people of this great country is what paid off. And that's how we were able to be able to come out of the Great Depression. An investment in ourselves is how we will accomplish the current debt price crisis we have. The only way we'll ever do that is we'll have to outgrow it. And outgrowing it means investing in the jobs and the communities that are out there to be able to invest in ourselves so that we can uh, create uh, what's the big thing happening down the road, which I have no idea what it is, but whatever it is, I think we need to be ready for that to happen. And investment in infrastructure will make that a real possibility. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, and thank you, Alfeca, and Stephen, for your presentations. We're now going to move on to uh, the uh, questions uh, that our uh, attendees have provided us, uh, many of which are excellent. And the first one uh, from Lisa uh, is, if Mitch McConnell remains in control of the Senate, is there any chance to co convince him or any pathway around him to make the National Infrastructure Bank happen? 
Let me start off by taking a stab at this question and then I'm gonna pass it on to Stephen because I think he has some comments too. Um, the legislation uh, that has been crafted to create the National Infrastructure Bank, which was discussed uh, a few minutes ago, um, has provisions that uh, 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 provide there to be a spread or a disbursement of economic development throughout the entire country. And I mention this because I think in terms of partisanship, in order for this uh, uh, legislation and concept uh, to pass and be successful, it's going to require there be development not only in urban areas, but also rural ones, which reflect both parties' constituencies. So having a balance and an incentive for rural communities in those, those areas, quote unquote, that are red, uh, is critical and, and I think uh, very much uh, a valuable carrot in order to convince both political parties that this concept is something that, uh, that the entire country can benefit from. Uh, uh, we uh, at the uh, National Infrastructure Bank Coalition sponsored and presented a webinar last month with regard to this very issue. So those of you that are interested in that, I suggest you uh, go to YouTube and see it, and, and we specifically discuss this. Stephen, I'm gonna pass the ball to you to give a little bit of history behind uh, why bipartisanship support of this idea is a real possibility and, um, and a necessity. Stephen. Thank you, Jack. I'm glad to, to say something about this because I think what is essential is for us to shift our attitude about government. Government is not the enemy. Government is the mechanism that we have to create great movement in our nation. Or as Jesse Jones said in 1937 about economic recovery, it will not happen if we believe our government is our enemy. Creating a national infrastructure bank is patriotic. It's a wonderful thing to do. It embraces love of country because it's going to help improve life for every person in the United States of America. So in a, a very simple answer to, for me is to say, let's change our attitude about government. Let's embrace government as something good, something that can be constructive and positive again. And I think that that's something that has to go along with this whole effort to create a national infrastructure bank. Uh, I'd like to elaborate for just a, a second on something that Bob said about aviation, uh, just to, to give you an idea of how monumental the investment was of the RFC. It invested 10 times more in aviation than the industry had invested in itself throughout its entire history. And what's important to know about all this is that at the end of World War II, the federal government through the RFC owned 70% of the aviation industry, almost all of the aluminum, steel, and magnesium industry, all of the synthetic rubber industry, but they never had the intention to nationalize anything. It was with the intent to preserve capitalism and democracy. So all of these plants that, that Bob referred to were sold to private industry at the end of World War II. And as far as the synthetic rubber plants go, the New York Times reported in 1955 when the last plant was sold that it, the effort was second only to the atomic energy program. And I bring this up to, to say, let's look at successes from the past for solutions today. We can use the same mechanisms and the same drive and unified effort to address the pandemic. There are so many applications if we just take a look Look at the successes from the past for solutions today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Stephen. Um, and uh, this is such a great question. We're going to have uh, Alfeca and Bob also give short responses, if you would, because we have several other uh, excellent questions pending. So Alfeca, take it away on this question. Thank you very much. And I, I agree, this is a really excellent question. So let's look at sort of the political landscape today where the, the Democrats have put forward bills to have a new stimulus package uh, that has been rejected by Mitch McConnell in the Senate and also to have a new reauthorization bill for infrastructure investment, which is the normal five-year reauthorization bill, which has also been rejected by the Senate. This bill uh, takes a different stance because uh, uh, HR2 
HR 6422 and this new National Infrastructure Bank will not need a net infusion from the federal budget in order for it to work. It's actually budget neutral and money that it takes on one side to capitalize, it, it pays back with its interest earnings on the other side. So this should make, it creates, it requires no new taxes, it creates no new deficit spending, uh, and so it should be appealable just on its merits uh, uh, for, to both Republicans and Democrats alike to make it more passable. But I'll say one more thing. In every single Republican district, there is infrastructure that has not been financed by the normal means. Uh, so any of those Republican districts that are desperate for infrastructure, and uh, I put out a newsletter which show uh, every day types of infrastructure that could fail at any moment. The Hudson River Tunnel, uh, Route 1 Highway in uh, Southern Florida, which has more accidents than any other road in the nation. Uh, the seawalls that uh, um, Stephen was talking about uh, protecting Houston. Uh, the worst water system in the United States is not now Flint, Michigan. It is Chicago, Illinois, which has more lead in its pipes than any other water district in the nation. All of these areas need desperate infrastructure investments, and all of these places need to have better paying jobs. Those two things are universal throughout the United States, and any single Republican district can go up to their congressmen and say, whether they're Democrat or Republican alike, and say, we need this infrastructure. This bank will finance this infrastructure, and so we'll want you to pass this bill on a bipartisan basis, and that will solve the, the block in the Congress. Thank you, Alpeca. Uh, Bob, your turn. Uh, the thing that uh, I think is uh, uh, really important to remember, you now have a president-elect, Joe Biden. Uh, with the presidency comes an awful lot of uh, equity, especially at the beginning of an administration, to be able to address and fix issues. With the amount of voters that he had to be able to do that, pressure can be brought upon an awful lot of Republicans to be able to hopefully take a look at this. There will also be an opportunity, in my opinion, for the NIB to get a real look with this administration. Uh, it needs to be partnered with the next increase in stimulus to be able to make this happen. Because the stimulus was basically handing out cash to be able to keep people afloat to be able to make things happen. And that has to, without a doubt, take place. But uh, it needs to be dovetailed with the National Infrastructure Bank so that we can actually address infrastructure regardless of party. We continue, if we continue that it has to be a party issue that, that uh, goes forward, we are doomed. Again, we are doomed if, if we continue to let, let any of the decisions that need to be made in this government to be decided by partisan politics. We have to, as a nation, understand that our neighbors, our brothers and sisters that are out there that are trying to, to, to make just make it uh, day to day, need the investment of infrastructure so that their community can start to improve and have a better opportunity to be able to put itself up on its own two feet, to be able to uh, provide good living wage jobs out there at the end of the day. And that uh, is the kind of pressure that the, the 76 million people who voted for Joe Biden need to put on uh, the Democrats. And it's something that hopefully our message gets out to people in all these communities, like Alfeca just said, who need infrastructure to be able to put that kind of pressure on the Republicans to be able to say, we need this fixed and here's a solution, let's do it. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next, uh, we have a question from Anthony and I think this would be directed to you, Stephen. Uh, what would uh, you say uh, are today's new issues that have been caused by the pandemic and the current administration's economic policies that would differentiate the infrastructure bank from the 30s, 40s, and 50s versus the proposed uh, national infrastructure bank that uh, uh, HR 6422 uh, proffers? Uh, I can't say how 
the RFC would differentiate from today's issues because so many of the strategies the RFC implemented can be adapted to today. And I take World War II mobilization as a perfect example of how we're handling the pandemic or are not handling the pandemic. If we had a concerted, concentrated, unified effort like we did during World War II, we would have plenty of protective gear. We would be implementing ways to distribute and store the vaccine once it's available. There are many ways we can implement strategies that were used during the Great Depression in World War II to adapt to today's issues. My favorite one is the Electric Home Farm Administration that allowed farmers to go into appliance stores, buy refrigerators, fans, pumps, radios. The RFC would reimburse the Main Street store for selling those appliances to the farmer. The utility company supplying the power to the farmer would put a small charge monthly into the farmer's bill, which he would pay, and the utility company would then forward those proceeds to the RFC. That helped more than a million people buy appliances. Those same, and it made money for the federal government. Let's always remember that these were lending programs, not spending programs. That same mechanism could be adapted today to retrofit people's homes so they're storm resistant and energy efficient and can help them bring broadband and internet access to their homes, especially to those people living in rural communities. So I hope that answers the question. We need to look at some success from the past to implement solutions today. Thank you, Stephen. Um, our next question is for Alfeca, uh, and it's an excellent one that uh, goes to the essence and uh, 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 the basic design of the National Infrastructure Bank. How is the National Infrastructure Bank to be funded, Alfeca? <laughs> Thank you very much. So this bank will be a public deposit money bank uh, that will actually uh, create the money that is lent at the time that loans are executed. All commercial banks operate in this manner. Um, when you go in, for example, to a bank for a car loan uh, and the, uh, the, the bank gives you, uh, you sign the loan papers, the bank puts that loan up on the asset side of its balance sheet, and then it creates a deposit on its liability side that you can draw down then to actually execute the car loan and pay the car dealership. Um, when it does that, uh, it creates a money supply that is then pushed out into the broader uh, um, banking system uh, through this check clearance process. Uh, this bank would operate in exactly the same way. Uh, it would, uh, like any commercial bank, it makes its money on the difference between the interest rate that it charges for loans and the interest rate that it must pay to depositors and any money that it borrows. Uh, that difference, uh, the spread, is uh, the net amount of financing uh, or income that's coming into the bank. And so this bank can live off of its own uh, net income earnings. Um, the uh, example, even though it is only charging very low rock bottom interest rates for its loans, which is the treasury bond rate or 2% uh, or there's a 2% floor. So uh, it will operate just like a commercial bank does. It would create the money uh, supply. The only thing that would be coming temporarily from the federal government is a 2% uh, um, uh, add-on to uh, those folks that bring in their treasuries to capitalize the bank. That'll be about 10 billion a year and it should be able to reimburse the government uh, who is a part owner in this bank uh, through a dividend to government. So that's what makes it budget neutral. Uh, so uh, we have uh, the, the exemplified example of the four banks that have come before in our nation's past, starting with Alexander Hamilton's first bank of the United States and, and ending, as Stephen said, with the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. All of these banks lent and uh, created money in this way, and uh, except for the RFC, which is a little bit different um, construction. But uh, the, the important point is they all made money from uh, their operations and ended their books in the black and made money for, uh, the, made money for the government as well. Thank you, Alfeca. Bob, we have a couple questions for you, if you could uh, uh, briefly respond to them. Uh, the first is, um, uh, are there any labor protections proposed uh, in the 
of HR 6422 legislation? And also, uh, uh, is there any assurance that manufacturing components of the bill will be made in the US uh, A as opposed to overseas? Uh, Bob? Uh, there are provisions that uh, there is a Buy America uh, provision in the, in the proposed legislation. The Buy America is actually uh, better than uh, a lot of the other uh, ones that have been put in previous legislation in that we are deadly serious about making sure that uh, the American people are the ones who are investing in ourselves and are the ones uh, who are creating the wealth and are the ones who uh, benefit from this. Uh, as far as labor protections, they have been addressed. Uh, they are continuing to be addressed. Uh, initially, we have put in labor protections to make sure that uh, wages of uh, Davis Bacon are, are put in, uh, in place. A and we are looking also uh, when it comes to rail, high speed rail, and that, that, that uh, the labor protections that have been fought for over the uh, years uh, are also incorporated into the bill. Uh, Thank you. And uh, Alfeca, uh, I think you might have something to add to that. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, the Buy America will be very important. All federal contracts are supposed to be Buy America. They're supposed to be let with Buy America. But the interesting thing is over the past four years, there, there was a, a news report that many of these contracts that were let out by the federal government did not enforce the Buy America clause. So we think that there's huge potential here for any of the industries that will go into the construction of this infrastructure. Take the, the steel industry, for example. We'll be putting in a lo whole lot of high-speed rail. Uh, we'll be building uh, rail cars uh, in America as, instead of importing them as we're currently doing. Uh, th there will be huge ramifications also for the cement industry. We do not want to buy dumped Chinese steel uh, which is not even fair because the uh, Chinese government is, is, is subsidizing the cost of that industry uh, and exporting dump steel. We want to make sure that we keep all of the steel factories in the United States working uh, and uh, it, even expanding the, the base of their um, pr uh, production. So those are the kinds of industries. And then all of the new technologies. Can, this is not going to be just replace it with the same old uh, uh, um, infrastructure that your grandfather knew. This will be the latest technologies with sensors on them to make uh, our uh, infrastructure uh, and investment and uh, the running of it and the maintaining of it much more smoother, which will um, make the infrastructure more long lasting. So there'll be lots of technology improvements uh, along the way as well. And then we want to see if we can do things uh, along the area of climate change to uh, have the greenest infrastructure that we can possibly uh, invest in. Things like uh, uh, th 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 there'll be a lot of cement used in this construction. So we want to use CO2 sequestering cement, even if it costs a little bit more, the, the uh, bank will provide the funding to, to cover those costs for, the, for that extra enhancement. So those are the kinds of things we want. And we have finally a, an enforcement mechanism within the NIB to make sure that the Davis-Bacon wage provisions, which are enshrined in law, are really actually implemented when the contracts are let. The same thing for Buy America and the same thing for uh, anti-discrimination clauses that are in US law. We wanna make sure this enforcement mechanism will make sure that all those are really adhered to in these projects. Thank you, Afeka. Bob, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If, if I could just uh, say two other things uh, uh, that was asked in that question. One, uh, how do we keep corporations from leaving? Uh, Oftentimes, we go and we vilify China and say, China's stealing our jobs. Mexico's stealing our jobs. That's BS. They're not stealing our jobs. Corporations are picking up their jobs here, and they're going to China, and they're going to Mexico for cheap labor to be able to do that. And we have to be able to hold corporations accountable. When they can use the tax laws and be able to get credit for taking jobs out of the United States and get a benefit from it, that's straight BS. We have to address that and fix that if we're actually going to uh, start to invest in ourselves and do that. And we have to have good corporate partners if we're going to make this happen. We can't continue to allow them to get away scot-free. And the other thing that I'd like to point out that, that Alfeca talked about is Chinese-made steel. They're able to do that because they have an infrastructure bank, a national infrastructure bank, just like what we're talking about. They have one that's investing in their infrastructure 
and in their steel plants, et cetera, to be able to make that kind of steel and bring it here and dump it. We need to invest in ourselves so we can have that kind of uh, ability and strength at the end of the day. Uh, thank you, Bob. Um, uh, I'm going to uh, ask you uh, 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 another question that's uh, topical as to our uh, 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 program today regarding veterans uh, and also combine uh, a question that Anthony has asked uh, with another concept. Uh, Anthony's question is, as a matter of bipartisan concerns, how can we highlight the role of the NIV in serving the needs of today's veterans, many who have served during the Vietnam War and wars since? Veterans in rural areas, including Native American tribes, such as the Navajo Nation with 10,000 veterans, suffer from poor housing, poor infrastructure services, such as lack of water, broadband, and poor roads. How about VA hospitals in such rural areas? How can the bank uh, uh, address these concerns? And also, Bob, could you also briefly talk about Helmets to Hard Hats program uh, uh, as far as labor is concerned? Sure. Uh, as far as housing, uh, historically, if you go back to World War II, housing was actually invested in by the, uh, <clears throat> the DPC. Housing for factories that were built outside of communities was actually built and, and uh, so that workers would have places to live close to the facility so that they go, could go to be able to work. We could do the same type of thing if we had, uh, if we put it on our agenda and said housing is very important in these communities and we actually invested in that housing and said this is a priority and we're going to start to do that. As far as other things that can be done, uh, investment in uh, VA hospitals and being able to can make sure that they have the facilities that are necessary to be able to do that. Uh, those are those are definitely things that uh, the the funding and, and the lending capability of the re, of the <coughs> National Infrastructure Bank could could address. Uh, and as far as helmets to hard hats, that that's a program uh, that's in the UA uh, that actually talks about um, going and getting veterans who are currently in the military and giving them the opportunity as soon as they come out of the military to be able to get into the, into the building trades, to be able to, to hopefully take their experiences and their uh, go um, get it attitude to be able to bring that kind of attitude into the building trades. Because the building trades and, and all jobs at the end of the day, we need to invest in our veterans. We have thrown them away in so many, uh, we always say, thank you, but then we forget about them. And it's unfortunate that in this day and age that we can't figure out that, that the people who are willing to make that kind of sacrifice, when they come back, they should be given the opportunities to be able to get involved in society again and be able to have some, maybe even a huge leg up because they've already shown that they can do uh, the, the hard work that's necessary to rebuild this country. And, and we need to start to value that in, in, great, uh, in, in a great way. Thank you, Bob. Uh, the next uh, group of questions uh, uh, that I'd like to present uh, and respond to uh, uh, has to do with the legislation itself, HR uh, 6422. Uh, one res uh, attendee, Susan states, uh, she has written her representatives to support the bill and it was not supported. Do you have suggestions on how one individual can approach a representative multiple times to get support, or is this just a waste of time? The other question from James is, what is the next significant step in the legislative process for HR 6422? Let me start off by responding to those two questions in this manner. Um, uh, this is a concept, an idea of a national infrastructure bank that is building momentum each and every day. And the reason that I say that is we are developing a network of support uh, throughout the entire country uh, as far as elected officials are concerned, uh, through uh, city councils uh, and county uh, government organizations and entities, uh, uh, through uh, labor unions, through um, uh, 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 academic uh, policy uh, uh, providers that uh, uh, are endorsing this 
concept each and every day. If you go to our website, you will see an accumulation of numerous entities that have supported this idea over the last two, three, four, five, six months. It is building momentum. So uh, um, uh, uh, reaching out to other organizations to endorse the concept and then taking it to your uh, uh, a congressional representative is one way to do it. Um, educating their staff as to what the benefits are or another. Uh, the next significant step is the, as far as the legislative process is concerned for HR 6422 is to convince Congress that it is a valid, legitimate, needed, necessary policy for our country. And uh, as the economic crisis continues, uh, the virtue and the benefits of this concept and legislation uh, will emerge. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to toss the ball to you uh, with regard to this question, and, and, and then I'll uh, Go ahead, Stephen. What I have done is write articles and letters to the editor of newspapers uh, to promote the bank and do whatever I can to uh, make people aware of the potential that a bank like this holds, and also by talking about the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, that there is a model for this, that it worked before and it can work again. Uh, as far as contacting our, our congressmen and congresswomen, I, I think we have to do that. Uh, as if we continue to do it and we do it in mass, maybe it will make a difference. But I think we have to do everything at our disposal to promote the bank, to explain the bank, to show the precedent for the bank, and to, to hopefully that will encourage this to, to move forward. And Alfeca, your, your comments and ideas. So we are on a short-term haul to, to deal with this uh, pandemic and economic recession and on a long-term uh, plan to deal with our infrastructure underfunding as well uh, and our lack of good paying jobs in the United States. One methodology for uh, one of the speakers that asked the question that, that's, that has been very successful uh, is, the, is the Michigan me methodology. What they did was they got together as a group. Uh, these were council, council persons uh, in the counties and state uh, and city governments that, that, just, uh, that just blanketed their area with uh, draft resolutions for every single uh, county and district and identified what infrastructure has not been able to be uh, repaired and then uh, got them to pass these resolutions and then they took all the resolutions and they took them up to the top and then presented them to the congresspersons. Uh, it's very much the case that uh, congresspersons will listen when they get a, a, an en masse um, movement of people who are coming and saying, we really need this, and they are their constituents. One person they might be able to brush off, but a whole group of them like that is very difficult to do. And even in Republican areas, I, again, I say, say to your Republican congresspersons, what is your plan? What is your plan for fixing this infrastructure? Uh, we, we have had a governor in one state who, who rode on the platform, fix the D roads, you know, so uh, that was her platform statement. And then she should be held accountable to whether or not she's been able to actually uh, fix those roads or not. What is your plan for getting people back to work and good paying jobs? And what is your plan for fixing the infrastructure? And here's a good plan to do both. Great, thank you, Alfeca. We're going to have one more question and then have our panelists give their closing remarks. Uh, uh, one of the questions that have come up is with the pandemic overshadowing uh, uh, much of what our country's attention uh, is focused on uh, above and beyond the presidential election, um, how uh, can the uh, uh, National Infrastructure Bank uh, receive the focus of attention that it needs, at least as far as in our opinion is concerned. And isn't such intervention uh, with the uh, background of the pandemic, uh, which will require high costs to the American taxpayer um, of, uh, um, uh, uh, be paid for? And won't an infrastructure bank um, save billions of dollars for the American taxpayer? Uh, if we could go through this very quickly and then give, up, uh, give our final closing statements. Uh, uh, Stephen, I'll go with you first, and then Alfeca, and then Bob. Um, that's that's a, a tough one to answer. Um, let me, let, if you would, go to Alfeca sure. on that one. Alfeca. 
<laughs> okay. Uh, from a, a budget point of view, I, I come back as, because I'm an economist. Um, we, our budgets will all be hit really hard this, this winter. This winter is the period where everything will sort of gel and solidify, and then we'll sort of see where we are. But it's very much the case that we are going to need a, a new stimulus package to bridge us over this, this period, um, to get checks uh, into people's pockets, uh, and to keep them from being evicted from their homes. And we'll have to do that through deficit spending. So that'll be another big hit to the federal budget. When we come out the other end, we'll still have a lot of people unemployed, a lot of people employed in very poor paying jobs that we need to get into better paying jobs if we're going to do something about poverty and income inequality. So the long term fix is really to get people into good paying jobs to fix our nation's infrastructure. And that's where this bill will really uh, come up to the head as the only possible alternative for us. Thank you, Alfeca. And Bob? Uh, the best social program out there it's called a job, J-O-B, a job. <laughs> the, the only way we can uh, get ourselves out of any of these things is to have the opportunity to have a job. If you get that, then a lot of things can happen. Then you can start to take care of yourself, your family, your friends, et cetera. So we have to make sure we, we, we focus on that. And what Alfeca said is true. There is going to be another stimulus package. There's gonna have to be. There are too many people who are, going to, who are already suffering from this, who have not been able to get a job or, or their places have been closed down because the pandemic has not been handled correctly. Obviously, we can make sure uh, to, to utilize the National Infrastructure Bank to be able to nationalize, if we have to, the production of PPPs, et, et cetera, to make sure they're, they're done in this country, to make sure that the drugs that are necessary out there are manufactured in this country. Those are all things that we can do specifically with this National Infrastructure Bank. At the end of the day, the only way we will solve this is we have to build the parade of what this is, which is a investment program in ourselves, a lending program in ourselves, and we have to go at the end of the day and say, we demand this. And we have to go uh, side by side with the uh, stimulus package that's gonna come and say the stimulus package is the short-term solution, the National Infrastructure Bank is the long-term solution and it has been done four times previously in this country. This is not a new idea, we forgot it. We have gotten into pay as you go and that's the only concept we can seem to do, but that's not the way it's always been in it. Every time there's been a specific crisis or we needed to do something, the National Infrastructure Bank model has been used. Alexander Hamilton was the first one when we came out of the World War, uh, uh, out of the Revolutionary War, where we had huge debt and we needed to get our feet going, uh, our feet under us to be able to make it happen. So we're in that same predicament now. We have to make sure the National Infrastructure Bank is looked at as the answer and stimulus package plus National Infrastructure Bank, short-term plan planning, long-term plan. And that's how we have to move this thing forward. Bob, thank and you for that. And now I want to now I want to give my answer. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I go back. I mean, I want to echo what Bob says. We have to go back to the past to look at the successes for solutions today. And I always go back to that electric home farm administration and how it can be used to retrofit homes and buildings so they're storm resistant and energy efficient. And by doing that, it will spur so much employment and Re, you know, and, and renew the green uh, energy industry. It will spur it all on. So if we look at these mechanisms that we have already used once before, we can apply them to today's problems, create jobs, expand our economy, and, and revitalize our nation. Excellent. Thank you very much, Stephen. And Alfeca, and I think uh, these comments are uh, maybe doubling for our closing statements too. So Alfeca, go ahead. So uh, our theme today is mobilization. Uh, we have now uh, an example of a new institution, the National Infrastructure Bank embodied in HR 6422, that can mobilize the finances 
that are needed to invest in infrastructure, create millions of great paying jobs, revitalize our economy, and, all, and do all of that without uh, increasing taxes or the debt. And this, path, this makes this bill passable uh, and attractive on both sides of the aisle. Great. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for your great presentations today. Uh, we are so happy that uh, our attendees and, uh, joined us for this event uh, and also want to remind people that we are going to have another webinar on November the 19th uh, titled Building Back Best and uh, it will be posted on our webinar and I think uh, we will have that uh, put up, uh, there it is, uh, on the screen. Uh, the National Infrastructure Bank and the U.S. Industrial Recovery. Please join us for that event on November 19th and also note our uh, website, which posts all of our previous um, uh, uh, webinars that we have uh, conducted uh, that are also on YouTube. So we thank you very much again for joining us today. Happy Veterans Day to all and uh, uh, acknowledge and remember our servicemen who've supported uh, and, uh, and committed uh, uh, so much of their lives in the past and the present. Uh, good day, everyone.